project that has published somewhere around more than 200 reports on what is happening on the internet, how the internet is changing our society, and how it is generally um, teaching us lots of new things about everything from politics to censorship. So the, the amount of, of different reports and, and interesting stuff out of the Pew Internet and American Life project is just amazing. So I'm really happy to have uh, our um, speaker here today. Um, Lee Rainey has been the director of the, the project for quite some time since? Ten years. Ten years now. And before he came to the Pew Internet Project, he was the managing editor of the U.S. News and World Report. He's a graduate of Harvard University, has a master's degree in political science from the Long Island University. And he's today going to be talking on, as you've probably seen these little things, the rise of networked individuals, the millennial tide. So please welcome Lee Rainey. It is, um, it's an honor for me and the Pew Internet Project to, to be here. It, it, one of the really fun things about a job like mine is people are nice to you like Nicholas. And it, he had no reason to be nice to me other than he works at a great place and he's a nice guy and uh, has given me a wonderful opportunity. For those of you who might need a, a Pew 101, Pew, I, I'm funded by a wonderful uh, public charity called the Pew Charitable Trusts. Uh, they have funded me to, be, to generate information. We do primary research into the social impact of the internet. Um, the Pew does other work that um, supports advocacy to help make the world better in a lot of ways, in the environment and healthcare, education and, and, and social policy. We're different from that in the sense that Pew has uh, ordered us not to uh, promote an agenda. We, we literally take no stands on policy issues related to the internet, technologies, companies, or people, but we do try to do uh, primary research that would be useful to people who are helping build the internet at every level, including uh, wonderful folks like like you. And uh, Pew is a family name. It's not an acronym. It's not P-E-W, all caps. It's Pew. It's a family name. It's, it's, a, it's a great uh, uh, oil and shipping fortune from the late 19th century that was passed along to the children uh, of the family. And they created charitable trusts. Uh, it's a, and so I, it's a precious thing to me because it's a family name. So I'm, I'm, I hope I don't mess up and, uh, and embarrass uh, the wonderful family that's been helping me. Uh, and in order to sort of uh, understand where I'm coming from, it, people don't necessarily grasp that, that an organization can be based in Washington and have no policy point of view. We call ourselves a fact tank because we don't advocate for things. And finally, that, that didn't seem to be working. And a, um, uh, a geologist actually came up to a colleague of mine and said, well, I get what you are. You're an internet geologist. You study the rocks. You just don't judge the rocks. So that's a, that's a great way uh, to understand what we are. As I say, we study the social impacts of the Internet. So we look at how the Internet affects families and communities and healthcare and education and things like that. Uh, and I will be talking about our research, but I'm, I'm pretty interested in hearing from you uh, if you know any of the work that we've done or if you think about the existence of an institution like ours. What should a place like ours that has no agenda, that has support to do primary research, what should we be looking at in the context of the social impact of the Internet? Um, I'd, I'd be particularly interested in hearing about survey ideas because we do the data I'm going to be presenting, a lot of it will be based on surveys. But we are just now dipping our toes in the water of thinking about how an organization like ours can do computational social science. So I, uh, in the questions that you have, and I would encourage you to ask questions as they arise, um, I'd be interested in hearing about your ideas, what we should do, and particularly how we can use uh, so the uh, massive amounts of data that are being generated here and in other places in the world. And the final thing I'm going to do before I start talking about uh, what I'm going to say is, is to issue my standard apology at the beginning of any speech I give. I am, uh, have uh, enculturated myself in the two worst communications cultures in America. I was born and raised in New York, so I talk really fast. So I apologize all at the beginning now that I'm going to speak quickly. I can't help myself. This is in my DNA. And then, of course, I moved to Washington at the midway point of my life so I can talk really long. So I, I can filibuster fast is basically uh, what I can do. And I'm sorry for that now. If I'm really going too fast for you, if you're having trouble understanding me, raise your hand, uh, give me a crook in my cheek or something like that, and I will try to respond to you. What I was going to do today is, um, is talk about a, a sort of a grand synthesis of the work that we've been doing since we went into business in 2000, and, um, and then to explore ideas about how we can move forward, not only with our survey work, but with this computational research. 
The big idea uh, that we've sort of pulled together, thanks to uh, our, our research and, and readings in, in other areas, is that people have moved in their social structures from a position of sort of tight-knit, bounded social relationships, where they live in small communities that everybody knows your business and everybody knows everybody else's business and everybody knows each other. That's the world of villages, tight-knit families, and even tight-knit workplaces. The argument that we see emerging in our data, and it began to emerge even before the technology uh, revolutions that we are under, is that the world has moved more towards networks. Uh, a colleague of mine, matter of fact, I'm writing a book with him, a sociologist at the University of Toronto named Barry Wellman, has talked about life in the latter half of the 20th century and the emerging part of the 21st century as being lived in a state of networked individualism, where we've moved from these tight-knit groups where we get our social support and our care and feeding and nurturing in the world to more networking behavior where we can maneuver a little bit more easily through more dispersed networks and more uh, kinds of social relations. But we pay uh, some car prices for that social change that I'll talk about later. Um, before I get to the technology piece of this, uh, I will uh, just run through a couple of big social and political trends that were already driving culture towards networked individualism, which means that people have more power themselves to be their own individual actors, or people are forced to be their own individual actors because social structures around them that were built on that tight-knit network um, were, uh, were changing. The first big change, of course, is uh, affluence and technology itself. It, it is put into our hands, particularly in the developed world, um, a sense that we can do more things on our own. We can array, we can use media, we can use uh, other tools at our um, disposal to do things that it used to take larger groups of people and collectives to perform. The second thing is that family composition itself has forced people to be networkers, as, as roles inside families uh, have become even more networked themselves. Think about uh, each spouse has his or her own uh, address book, his or her own uh, professional network to deal with, his or own, uh, her, his or her own uh, social networks to deal with when they have uh, troubles in their lives. Families themselves have become networks, and so people even inside their own households have now had to take more responsibility on for managing their own lives and, and engaging the world in their own ways. There's obviously been a proliferation of consumer choice in the world. We have to make more choices, and we want to make more choices as, as the array of stuff that enters our life and the array of services has grown, so we have to be active agents in exploring all of that. Income and wealth volatility have increased, in, particularly in America in the past two generations. Job security and job longevity have decreased. We're cycling through more jobs, doing more things with ups and downs in our wealth status, ups and downs in our income status. We just have to be on top of more things. The old social contract, as you know, about somebody locking in with an employer at age 19, living with that employer to age 60 or 65, and having all his or her needs met by that employer during the period of employment and then even post-employment, that has broken down now in the age of multiple careers, massive churn in the job market and things like that. That's caused a, a, an increase in free agency. There was a wonderful book written uh, a couple of years ago by Daniel Pink who talked about the rise of the number of Americans who were on their own in the workplace, sometimes by choice, because they had the tools and the capacity and the knowledge to do it because they want to do it. They want to be their own boss. Some people by, um, by circumstances that were forced on them. They had to add another income stream to their life, so they did things uh, after work in their homes, or they tried to sell things on the weekends, or they developed a, an eBay or an Amazon contest, uh, account to sell things. Overall, Pink added up in about 2001, 2002 that there were 35 million people who were sole proprietors working on their own businesses or working in very small family businesses. That, it, that was a doubling of the number who were in free agency kinds of situations a decade before. And there were probably more still now since we've turned through a recession now that is forcing more people to act as their own agents or supplement uh, their work life with other kinds of things that they do on their own. Um, there's been a, you know, a big change in, in, in employer relationships with employees, where now employees have to take more care of their health care and of their own pensions. Again, when in, in that lifetime guarantee of work situation, the employer would provide the pension. You served your time in the company. You went out, and, they, and the company kept sending you checks. That is no longer the case for the majority of Americans. They have to manage their own retirement. They have to think about their own investments, and they have to plan for them in ways. So that's forced them to fall back again into individual strategies rather than group strategies to manage their stuff. 
And then finally, there's sort of bigger social ch changes outside the realms of, of, of people's uh, personal lives that have also prompted them to become more independent actors in the world rather than group actors in the world. I call this sort of DIY, do-it-yourself, politics and religion even. In, the, in colleagues' work that's, that's done by the Pew Research Center uh, for the people in the press, they do a lot of political anal analysts, and they're, and they're just down the hall from us. They live in the same organization that we do. They have charted now for the first time in the history of polling that the largest block of voters in this country are self-defined independents. There are more people who say now, I am independent of political parties than say they are attached to either the Democratic or the Republican parties. We've never seen this before. So again, it may, it's a trend that pushes people more towards cobbling together their own political belief system, their own values and structures, rather than affiliating with formal institutions. In religion, uh, amazingly enough, this same trend is taking hold. 44% of Americans, in a survey that was done by our colleagues uh, at the Pew Religion Forum, have changed the religion of their childhood in the course of their adulthood. So 44% of people in America now are practicing a religion or connected to some kind of, of faith system that is not the same one that they grew up with and were taught. Uh, people are, again, sort of mixing and matching some of their belief systems, or they're finding other places that serve their needs than the ones that serve their parents. It, nobody has ever done work like that before, so I can't say that that trend is massively greater than it was in the past. It's probably pretty typically American compared to lots of other cultures, but it still goes to show that there are significant numbers of people who are sort of making it up as they go and acting as, as networked individuals. And finally, even before the Internet uh, and global revolution, but certainly accelerated by both those revolutions, there's the DIY health world that we're in. There are a lot more people now that are acting as, as uh, more aggressively as the agents of their own health care. They are looking up stuff uh, in, in the old, in the pre-internet days, in all kinds of pamphlets and books and magazines and, and things like that. Now, of course, they're turning to the internet to make sense of the things that have been told to them about what's wrong with them, or even before they've been diagnosed, to try to figure out what's going on in their lives and so that they can become active agents in their own care, in a way that, um, you know, you think of the, um, the pre-internet model of the doctor-patient uh, relationship. Patient uh, has a couple of meanings in America. The patient was patient, sort of waited for the doctor to decide after a two-minute encounter, well, everything that was wrong with you and prescribe everything for you, right? Well, th those patients are not patient anymore. They're going out and they're, they're, they're doing their own searches and they're walking into doctor's offices with lots of printouts from the web and saying, why not give me this drug? Or why didn't you tell me about this side effect? Or why didn't you tell me about this clinic that is giving a new experimental treatment on this? So people, again, are being much more active in managing the, the central affairs of their life. That's the hallmark of networked individualism. And of course, technology enters the picture and puts everything that has already come before it on steroids. All of the trends that were in evidence in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, before the, the internet was mass adopted and before mobile phones became staples of people's lives, um, are now sort of uh, intensified in all of these ways. And it's particularly true of those who are under age 30, the people that we call millennials, the people who um, have grown up in, in, in respect in a world where it was not possible to know a world without the internet and increasingly not to know a world without cell phones and mobile connectivity built into it, people are now acting as these um, as, as networked individuals in ways that they couldn't have before they had these technology tools available to them. Quickly to orient you about the sort of dimensions of the, of the tech revolution, when we went into business, we were sort of in the midway, we went into, uh, we did our first survey in March of 2000, so we were sort of midway through the mass adoption period of the consumer internet. Um, the first survey we did in March of 2000, 46% of adults used the Internet, 73% of teenagers used the Internet. Now it's 75% of adults and 93% of teenagers. It's important to remember uh, as you are um, thinking about that, that's, that's an incredible growth story and it's an incredible adoption story that um, in some sense is unparalleled in, in the sort of mass consumer goods. But it's still the case that 25% of Americans don't use the Internet. 
Uh, they are older, they are less well-educated, they have fewer resources available to them, they're likely to have a handicap or, or, or disability, and in America, they're much less likely to feel uh, comfortable speaking English as their primary language. We do our survey work both in English and Spanish, and we ask at the very beginning, how would you like to take the survey? The people who choose to take the survey in Spanish are less likely, statistically significantly, to be Internet users than those who are comfortable with English. Yeah. The 7% seven, the of teenagers who uh, do not use the Internet are mostly lower income or rural. Uh, some some are, have handicaps, but in many cases it's available at their schools or local libraries, and they just are, aren't comfortable with it or aren't um, happy to say that they uh, are an Internet user. They often will use their friends to do key communications for them, like texting, emailing, or something like that. They will often have their friends do um, searches for them, but they don't classify themselves as Internet users, so if there's a bit of a knowledge issue, there's definitely a resource issue. They are poorer than the rest of Americans. They're much more likely to be rural. Um, the this, this sort of second way that we've seen an incredible change in the Internet is that in that first survey we asked uh, about broadband connections, less than 5% of Americans had broadband connections. Now 62% of Americans have them at home. So the Internet experience at home now is high speed, always on. It's not great high speed, uh, but it's, it's a very different experience from the dial-up experience. And in our research, we consistently see the people who convert from dial-up to broadband become vastly different kinds of internet users. They are, they build it more into the rhythms of their lives, they care about it more, they're on it more, they like the outcomes of their internet use better, and it is, it is transforming even yet again as premium services come online and as uh, places like yours are offering speeds up to a, a gigabit. Um, at the time we went, first went into business, uh, half the adults in the country had cell phones, now 80% do. At the time we went into existence, we didn't even ask a question about wireless connectivity. It was only something that people with the most sophisticated equipment could possibly do, is connect to the Internet wirelessly. Now we find that 53% of, of people connect either through wireless cards in their, their laptops or portable computers or through their handheld devices. About a third of cell phone owners now connect to the Internet through their cell phones, and in some respects it's changing the nature of the digital divide because they're disproportionately minorities. They're more likely to be Hispanic or African American than they are to be white. And so the digital divide, uh, even for non-Internet users, is shrinking a bit because mobile connectivity is bringing more people uh, online. And of course, uh, we, didn't, we, didn't, we don't ask cloud questions in 2000, and we don't ask a, a sort of consistent battery of cloud questions because it's really hard to capture and people don't quite know whether they're on the cloud or not. Uh, but it's, e it's sort of easy to say that there were very few uh, people who had like webmail accounts in 2000, and now uh, uh, probably over two-thirds use cloud computing functions in one way, shape, or another. 57%, as I'll tell you later, 57% of Internet users now are social networkers, which is all taking place in the cloud. So the environment that we've measured just in the life of the project in 10 years has gone from sort of slow connections through wires to my computer to fast mobile connections through somebody else's server, um, and that has sort of changed people's relationship to information and changed their relationship to other people, and again, made them more... Um, performing like networked individuals. One of the things that networked individuals do um, in, in, the, in this environment over time is that they change the composition of their networks. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in the life of the project is that, um, that networks are now bigger than they used to be, um, if, depending on how you classify it. They're looser in the sense that there are probably not that many more tight-knit friends that people will describe in their networks, but there are many more loose connections, weak ties, or even sort of very distant ties in people's lives with whom they can interact and from whom they can solicit support and offer support if they want to. And so the networks have expanded in really interesting ways, particularly in that more casual realm as people can maintain their relationships with others pretty easily with technology rather than having to phone call somebody all the time or make appointments to meet them. It's just easier to have these relationships have meaning even in a very casual sense because technology is used. Uh, layers of uh, networks have become more segmented. People now, this is the sort of essence of networked individuals, and people have sort of portions of their network that they consult depending on the needs that they have in their life and the needs that others express to them. So that some people think about your own networks. If you had a financial problem, there are probably a couple of people in your network that you'd ping to help you answer questions or solve problems in that. They'd be different 
from the people that you would consult if you had a health problem, who would still yet be different if you had a spiritual or emotional problem in your life. So we're now sort of segmenting our layers based on functionality, on people's closeness to you, on your need, and at the time of your need. And so this networked individualism environment is one where people are more liberated than they were in the past. You know, that sort of um, social atmosphere of the small town where everybody was connected to everybody else and your mom could tell everybody else what was going on with you and they discipline you too. Um, that has been broken apart and it's, so it's more liberating. People have more maneuvering room than they used to to get through, negotiate life and not have every element of their business known by everybody in their, in their network. So in some sense, uh, most people would say that's, a, that's not a bad thing. At the same time, uh, the social safety net that they had in that world of tight networks is a bit more frayed. They can't depend on a cl small cluster of people always to anticipate their needs, always to meet them where, where they needed to, or always to call on them when they had needs. So people have to work harder in this environment to get their needs met. And one of the, the they do two things uh, connected to, to social networking that matter a lot, particularly in the context of this company. The first is they use their social networks more to, to do a lot more things for them. As people are in an environment, for instance, that is full of data coming at them, full of inputs, full of media, uh, just, you know, information overload is a standard way we talk about this. The primary coping strategy that people use in that is to turn to their networks, to help them filter information, to help them curate information, to help them assess information. If you encounter lots of information after you've done queries in the world and you're not quite sure what weight to give what facts, people turn to their, to their networks, particularly the experts in their networks, to help them make sense of all that they've got. And then a new feature of network is that uh, particularly those outer rims of networks, they become an audience for social networkers. They can become people that you broadcast to if you have a social network site or profile. They can be people if you have a blog that you can um, sort of tell your story to without necessarily having it be a reciprocal relationship or having expecting anything back from them other than their attention and their care and every once in a blue moon maybe uh, answering things that you have to do. So what, let me just stop there. Uh, this is my one sort of filibuster pause moment to make sure that, that one part of the data dump that I've gone through makes sense to you. Does this mostly make sense? Okay, good. Um, so I'll quickly run through now uh, eight ways that I think the uh, information ecosystem has changed, thanks in, in, in great measure to, to, to folks like you and company, companies like this, and why that matters in the context of uh, the way people think about and use their social networking, uh, their social networks. The f obviously, the first one is that the volume of information itself has increased. There's just more stuff being generated in more ways, flowing into people's lives in an ambient environment where they can connect to the internet everywhere. It literally is all around them, and people begin to think of it as all around them. Um, and in some sense, that's great. Americans sort of say they like lots of information, lots of choice. Uh, they don't want to um, have um, restrictions or, or limits placed on it. On the same uh, side of the coin, though, it's, it's disorienting to have that much stuff sort of endlessly pouring at you and have a sense that an even bigger sense uh, uh, waves are, are coming past the one that the tsunami that's already hitting you. So the sense that I can master maybe stuff today, but God knows what's going to happen tomorrow as more stuff flows into my life. So, this, so that the volume of information and, and, and the sense that people have about its meaning to their life is disorienting and, and sometimes exciting, but oftentimes a, a big challenge. The second way um, the ecosystem has changed is that the variety of sources of information have proliferated. Obviously, when you have more cable ch channels to watch, more websites to go to, more search engines to choose from, um, and so many and more gadgets to display them all on, uh, people have a sense that they are now encountering more information from more places, more people, more points of view than they used to before. It's not necessarily the case that they're taking advantage of it. You know, there are a lot of people who are sort of narrowing their information universe uh, using new tools uh, to, to, to get the information that mostly lines up with the information they, or the world as they see it, or the belief system as they have it. Um, but it's still the case that there's just more stuff out there, and it adds to the sense that volume is growing. Uh, and, and new creators are obviously coming on the scene every day. Right now, um, 
we basically add up all the ways that people can create content online, and our, our rough guess is that about two-thirds of adults and three-quarters of teenagers are content creators. They have done one, at least one thing, and usually multiple things that have pushed out content for others to see and share online, and that's just sort of changed the way that they act in networks and changed the way that they maintain their networks in a variety of ways. Just quickly running down it, uh, more than half of Internet users now, adult uh, adults are social network site users. Three quarters of teenagers, uh, more than three quarters of 20 somethings uh, use social networking sites. About half of adults and about uh, three quarters of teenagers share photos online. Um, it, and the people who do that are really different social beings from the people who don't share pictures online. They are just more engaged with their friends. They know more about their friends. They're confident that their friends know more about them. And, and, and picture sharing itself is sort of a special networking activity that wasn't really afforded in the days before the Internet. About a third uh, share personal creations of one kind or another. They've, they've um, composed something, they've written something, they've drawn a piece of art, and they share it online. About a third now... Um, uh, contribute to rankings and ratings online. They've posted comments. They've done the thumbs up or thumbs down on the star rating system. We consider that it's simple content creation, but it's still them contributing their sense of what's going on uh, to the world. Um, about a quarter have created content tags and, and left them up for the others to see. Uh, about another quarter posts comments on sites uh, and blogs so that they think of themselves as participators in the news environment, in the health environment, in the politics and civics environment, in all kinds of places. About 20% of, of adults are Twitter users. Uh, it, it compared to only about 8% of teenagers. Twitter is not for teenagers, it's for 20-somethings and even uh, more for 30-somethings uh, and 40-somethings. 15% of people still have a personal website, 15% of people are content remixers. They find things online, pictures, music, videos and other things. They, they play around with it in one shape or form and then push it back out for the others to enjoy. So they're, the remix culture is sort of very alive and well on the Internet. And about 14% uh, are bloggers. There's one sort of special dimension to new data that I thought would be um, important to the, to the YouTube folks who are watching or are in the room. We're just about to put out some new data on, on video sharing and video use online. Now, for the first time in our measurements, more than half of American adults more than two-thirds of Internet users have consumed or downloaded video online, and 14% share videos. They up, upload them, uh, and we have some data in there showing up the meaning of those, uh, of those uploads and, and the purposes for which people do them and who they think the audience is for those, uh, for those videos. And interestingly enough, uh, we're just beginning to capture the earliest phase of a number that I know is going to grow over time. 8% uh, of Internet users have watched Internet um, programming on their TVs. They plug their uh, computer stuff or they plug a USB device into their TVs and now the TV is increasingly uh, likely to be a hub of all kinds of content, not just broadcast and cable content. So that, uh, that's the end of the second part of the, the ecosystem change, content creation and visibility of creators. The third change is uh, people's vigilance has changed. You know, the, the V pattern of my words might be coming cl clear, to you, clear to you now. That's my word for attention. And attention is actually changing in two directions in this environment. The most obvious one is, and the one that gets the most cultural commentary is, uh, is it's getting truncated. Um, you know, multitasking has now collapsed uh, lots, of, lots of people's attention into short little snack type bites, and there's less, um, uh, you know, deliberate, purposeful, long-term engagement with content than before. You might have heard uh, my wonderful uh, friend's idea, Linda Stone, a technology consultant who uh, has worked at a variety of places, talks about us all living our lives in a state of continuous partial attention where sort of every device we have in our lives is constantly on and constantly capable of, of interrupting us. Uh, and she worries about the stress that that creates to life. I hear from people in business context that that's sort of the only way to live. You've got to be on the grid. You've got to make sure that you're available for, uh, you know, interventions from bosses and clients and customers and even competitors, and it's, it's, it's not something that you have discretion over. So attention's getting truncated, but it's also getting elongated in this world. This is a great age of, of amateur experts. If you want to get, uh, you know, uh, an expert, gain an expertise in a subject that you didn't care about a year ago, a week ago, or a month ago, you can do it now thanks to the wonderful 
the tools and the wonderful content that's available online. And so the, the healthcare example is a primary example of how people who didn't know that they or a loved one had a condition yesterday did find out and now are anxious to become the world-class expert on that subject and can do it in this environment. They can access clinical trials. They can get the same kind of medical literature that their um, specialist provider provides them. There are people who worry about this, too. I mean, the, 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 the age of the amateur expert is wor makes people worried that you guys probably hear from a lot. Well, this has destroyed the sort of traditional structures of gatekeeping in our culture that used to do careful editing and careful fact-checking and, and make sure that the best, most highest quality information had sort of been filtered through the system before it was disseminated. Now any knucklehead can, can put out anything and make it look halfway credible and stuff. And there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of cultural commotion about whether this is good or not. Andrew Keane um, uh, wrote a book called The Cult of the Amateur with, that sort of codified this argument that we're not doing ourselves any favor by adding so many more voices from so many other points of view with so little credentialing uh, supporting them and so few processes sometimes supporting their information. So it's just a, you know, I'm not going to settle that argument. We don't take positions on things. But it's certainly true that attention is, is sort of splaying out in both directions in this environment thanks to uh, technology. The fourth change is the velocity of information is changing. And, it, and the way that it, this most dramatically shows up in our data is, uh, is not so much big stories that we all find out really quickly when big news happens, like the, the, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill or the, or, or, or the uh, you know, Times Square um, uh, attempted terror bombing. We always have found out about that stuff. In the age of TV, we've found out relatively quickly about that. What's different about this age is the sort of middle tier of information that matters mostly to us. The velocity of that information is what's picked up and been disorienting to people in this environment. Think of the ways that they set up alerts and RSS streams and they use listservs and things to gather up information on the subjects and policies and personalities and, and the hobbies that matter to them. Now all this stuff sort of floods into their life not necessarily in real time, but close to real time in ways that it never used to before. They used to have to subscribe to specialty publications or go to specialty meetings to learn about new things that are happening. Now that in information input is coming in relatively quickly, and about um, half or more of Internet users have set up some sort of way uh, to, to participate in groups online and learn about this middle information. The fifth change is that the uh, venues and availability of information have changed. It used to be that we had appointments with media. We watched certain TV shows at certain times that they were on. We watched them on the platforms that they were made available on. Um, that, that, and we did it on the schedule that they gave us. Well, now in the era of mobile connectivity, devices that give us media anytime and anywhere, we are in charge of the playlist. We are um, of watching TV on something other than a traditional TV. We're reading newspapers on something other than traditional newspapers, and it's sort of rebalanced the relationship between the people who used to be the producers and articulators of the scheduling of information and the consumers who now have much more control not only of, of when they're going to encounter media, uh, but their capacity to, um, to contribute to media. The sixth change is the vibrance of information has changed, too. The immersive qualities of information in this age has gotten a lot better as computing power, bandwidth has grown. Uh, the, even the pixels we can display have become more tightly packed and more colorful. Uh, there are now sort of more engaging worlds, particularly in the gaming environment, uh, but also in all kinds of, of, of virtual spaces that are pretty compelling and pretty interesting and pretty connected to what, what interests people. Um, I would argue that, you know, that, that, that this company in particular is at the forefront of two trends that we are going to be measuring a lot in the coming um, in the coming years, just because they speak to this issue of the of the vibrance of information, augmented reality. I mean, we're just packing more stuff as we merge the virtual and real worlds with data on top of, of real artifacts and real landscapes and things. People are en engaging those spaces now in different ways in the mobile environment, and will do so even more still as more information gets packed in, more knowledge gets embedded in artifacts, and as the apps get better. You know, it's just it's just that simple. And of course, mirror worlds, you guys have, have sort of given us the iconic example of that in, in Google Earth. It's just These are just powerful tools now where stuff that we know and we experience can be um, embedded into representations of the real world uh, that makes people sort of more capable of being actors in that real world in the sense of, of networked individualism. The seventh change is uh, the valence of information has gotten better. We find more stuff that's relevant to us than ever before 
thanks in large part because search engines are doing such a wonderful job at that. The semantic web might uh, be even better at, at, uh, at, at giving us information like that. But even in simple forms now, about half of Internet users in one way, shape, or form, customize information flows into them. They, they've set up RSS feeds. They've, they've customized a web page. They've, they've uh, belonged to listservs or other kinds of groups that act as uh, sort of sentries and, and information sources for them on the particular things that they care about. The final change is that voting and ventilation about information um, is, uh, well, actually, let me take your question now. Yeah. It, it's, uh, well, collectively, it's about half of Internet users have done one thing or another that customizes flows of information into their life at least a part of the time. It's alerts, it's streams, it's, it's the web page configuration, um, you know, that stuff like that. And, and then we even uh, count uh, sort of listserv users if they are of a certain kind who sort of um, are active with their group and are depending on that group to feed them information about the subject that the group was formed around. It's probably, that probably, um, if you're being skeptical about that number, I appreciate you're skeptical. And I think it's probably a little low. I think if we actually did real close uh, observational work, we'd see a lot more people e even using mental strategies, not just technological strategies to customize the flow of information. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, research now coming out of the uh, scholarly community about people being more strategic readers now than they used to be. And they're, you know, the strategies, literally iScan um, uh, tests have shown how they sort of parse uh, all the stuff that they need to much more rapidly now. And, and there are interesting ways that they make choices to read more deeply in the certain things that, that seem to be interesting or relevant or, or you know, breakthroughs in their fields. Is that, is that helpful? Uh, Yeah, um, it's. I think the way we think about it is, is two completely different things. When, I, in the, when I'm talking about the relevance of information, I'm talking about strategies that, that people deliberately set up to use so that they can get access to the content that matters to them. In the context of um, content creation, social networking, and stuff like that, people are doing other things with that. In some sense, they're, they're, they're depending on their networks to be sentries and information filters for them, but there are a lot of other reasons that people have participated in that universe as well. They want to share their lives. They want to do uh, touch points with people in their network. They want to see what's going on in people's lives that maybe isn't relative or relevant to particular things they care about, but they like that person and they want to know what that person had for lunch or where they're going on vacation. So it's, it's measuring two different things. They're not, I, I don't see them as in conflict. Um, and so the, the eighth point is uh, that uh, voting and ventilation about information uh, is proliferating as people tag content and um, comment. And, and you know, when we did some work um, looking at how people use news sites. And one of the things we found is that a, a primary marker for people of a trustworthy news site now is the ability to comment and read other people's comments about news stories. As toxic as they are, and as sort of incendiary as lots of the commenting is on media sites, people sort of still think that that's now a sort of new element of, of, of trust that they have with that organization and, and the willingness of that organization to be transparent. A lot of people don't care what's on the, the content of the comments, but they like the fact that they're there and they like the fact that there's available interactivity. So what has uh, all this technology done to networks, particularly to millennials, the people who are under 30 and, again, are sort of living in this life? The, the first most obvious thing to say about it is that it's made uh, networks more vivid for people. They actually have a physical sense of their social networks that their parents, their grandparents, and their other ancestors never had, in part because you know, the technology, in many cases, displays their networks for them and allows them to see what's going on and stay in touch in ways that they never could before. So networks themselves in people's lives are reified. They're, they're sort of um, made human in ways that they, they weren't before. Um, this technology has allowed for immediate ad hoc creation of networks. Um, maybe you're familiar with the wonderful, uh, well, two actual wonderful books, Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everybody, and um, Howard Rheingold's book, Smart Mobs. People f in this environment form networks to help them solve problems uh, on the fly. A lot of times their networks are sort of permanent people, but in many cases when people have a sort of simple need to answer a question or a simple query or, or something like that, they will just sort of 
ping their network in the broadest sense. They'll post it on Facebook, they'll tweet, they'll tweet it, they'll stick it on their blog, and, the, and the, the, the crowd will answer their question or the crowd will give them input, and um, that's, that, that network sort of assembles for that purpose and then disbands. So that's a sort of new function in networks that is enabled by these technologies. Um, these networks have added more segments, as I described before, um, especially related to communities of interest. Um, and one of the th most striking things, again, that we see in our health research is the power of network, social network uh, segments that we call just-in-time, just-like-me networks, where people who have a particular need, I've just been diagnosed, what's it like? Or I've, I've, got, a, I've got an appointment at the doctor's, can someone drive me there? Um, I, my child is, has got this, my dad needs this kind of care. And people who are, in many cases, strangers in, in the right spaces under the right circumstances will answer their questions based on their particular parallel circumstances. There's a special power in that to networks, even though that they might be taking place between strangers, because people were, when people are in sort of a, a situations of acute need, they mostly like to hear from people who have gone through the same thing and are mostly like them. So it, 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 even more so than family members who might offer words of comfort or, or trusted friends like a, a minister who might offer uh, words of wisdom or words of counsel, if you can find the mother who has gone through the exact same thing with roughly the same age child that you're going through, there's a special power in meaning that uh, that is brought out by these new kinds of networks. Um, this, this new technology has made the act of media making a part of networking activity. Media now um, are, are literally active agents in, in people's networks. I get knowing nods when I go out and speak to the world and I speak to you know, journalistic groups and library groups and media companies and, and nonprofits of all kinds uh, when I say, you know, think about your networks, uh, think about this point in the following way. Do you use Google as a tie or a node in your network? And people will nod yes, that they will, when they have a need, it's particularly obvious it starts with an information query, but if they know that their network can't solve it, or if it's something embarrassing that they don't want to share with their network, or if it's at a time of day when they don't want to bother anybody in their network, they will turn to the internet generically, but often to a search engine like Google to begin the process of finding out what's going on, how can I cope with it, where can I get the support that I need. So media itself, the internet sort of generically, uh, and search engines in particular, are active agents now in people's networks that they consult as they, as they have done what people have always done with their networks, which is to solve problems, make decisions, and gain um, support that they need. That means that organizations can now be much more active agents in people's networks than they ever used to. It's since media now is personal and social, even organizations that uh, are using these media are in people's minds now sort of nodes in their networks. If they have a question they want resolved, they are as happy to turn to a helpful institution like a library, like a search engine, like a nonprofit that might be able to give them uh, information about resources in their community, and think of that as an active agent in their network. And when we ask people about how they solve problems and how they get information needs met, we often find that they consult three or four different types of media, different types of people, and media themselves now are active players in that segmenting of, of social networking markets and, and information uh, queries. And finally, uh, the big change, one of the big changes uh, in networks that's been brought upon uh, by, by technology is that uh, consequential strangers and, and sort of that outer layer of a network can be much more active players in people's networks as they are trying to have questions answered. You don't have to know somebody intimately to ask for their help and in this environment get somebody's help back. It's just me meant that, they, they, again, people have added another layer or two to their social networks because they can count on the goodness of strangers in many cases or count on the attention of strangers uh, as they are trying to negotiate the world. Um, the generational story in this is, is pretty interesting. It's, it, 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 those who have grown up with these technologies are, you know, sort of add 20% to all the data points I gave you before if you want to talk about people under age 30. They are much more active, much more filtering, much more engaged, much more likely to be concerned about things than, than their elders. Um, they are the ones who are now obviously sort of live in a networked environment and think of the network as the sort of dashboard of their 
not only of the internet to them, but of their social worlds. They check in constantly, they monitor constantly, they feel they themselves are being monitored constantly. Many of them think now that they have an obligation to their networks to post material, to update where they are and what's going on and post pictures and, and things like that. So, th so the people now who are under 30 have a much more expansive sense about what social networks can mean and what they, what role that they play in people's lives, which doesn't mean that they don't care about privacy and sharing and, and all the, uh, the issues related to that. It just means they have a different sense of it and they have um, uh, a um, it's sort of a logic uh, of life that grows out of first their use of the internet and now their use of their uh, mobile phones that I want to be in touch, I want to be perpetually in contact because that's what these technologies allow me to be, and that's kind of fun because I like my friends and I like to, to be engaged with my friends. Um, and I'm finally going to run through uh, a bunch of questions that we wrestle with, which sort of the, the, a series of questions about the dark side or issues about the dark side of all this life because it's a, it's a pretty rosy picture that I've been painting because people like it and they say they like it and they say they get things out of it. But there are things to think about, and I, I would invite your attention to these, and maybe we can think about... Um, how we could structure questions with your data sets that uh, might might bring helpful answers. Um, one of the questions is sort of tech-induced isolation. There are people who worry that this environment is so compelling now that people will turn to it as a substitute for engagement in real life, that people prefer living in virtual space rather than face-to-face -face space because it's easier, it's less hassle, it's less uh, threatening in some respects, and it's just it's just an easier way to be, particularly if you're not necessarily the most extroverted person. A lot of the data we see cuts against that, that the people who are the heaviest tech users are also the most socially engaged, uh, have the most uh, large scale and most diverse networks, but there's something to, to worry about that obviously nags at the culture and, 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 and we get it reflected in our lives uh, a lot of times. Um, there, obviously, there's the privacy question. In this environment where so much is being disclosed and so much is being captured and so much can be um, molded together, there are ways now that um, people are anxious about the degree to which they are ceding control of their um, identity. The millennials' uh, story in this is a little bit different. My friend Dana Boyd has the smartest formula, formulation of this. In the policy sphere in privacy, you talk about personally identifiable information, PII, right? That's the term of art. Well, Dana says for kids or for you know people under 30, it's not so much PII as PEI. They worry about personally embarrassing information. Their metric for figuring out what to disclose or what can come back to bite them is not necessarily their email address or their cell phone number that can be used or text or their birthday, which all of them will disclose under virtually any circumstances, but it's stuff that's embarrassing that could come back to challenge who they are and to make life more uncomfortable for them as they find new employers, find new significant others, uh, find all sorts of new ways to engage the world. And so privacy has a somewhat different context in this, in, in this social networking environment than it might have had, especially for Americans in the past. Uh, and then there finally, you know, there's the, there's the sort of biggest series of issues that these technologies allow all sorts of great social interactions and community formation to take place. It is indiscriminate about whether good guys are performing those acts or bad guys. It, it's just as easy for bad guys to find new communities of interest and perform new uh, sort of outreach with these technologies, recruit new members, gain new things, and actually reinforce their belief system. And in this environment, it's a lot easier to find people who sort of think exactly like you do. And you can screen the world in a way that you don't have contrary information or, or other data that challenges that point of view. And so it's self-reinforcing. So lots of communities uh, get power out of that. Think of the people who suffer from rare cancers who now have new hope because they can meet people like them and learn from people like them. But it's the same uh, dynamic that allows terrorists and pedophiles and other awful actors also to engage in, in that kind of behavior. So that's uh, just uh, to get out of the uh, act of depressing you in the final moment of my talk. I, I will say that the evidence about the power of social networks is um, is pretty clear on this. There's a long here history of data uh, that Wellman and others have 
collected on this uh, that people who have big networks, uh, particularly with lots of weak ties, or people that are outside that boundary of, uh, of, of really tight-knit friends, and people who have diverse networks, people who have people in their networks who don't share their same belief system, don't share their same socioeconomic status, their same uh, race or creed or color, or uh, people who have more diversity in their networks get a lot of benefits out of that. People who have bigger, broader networks are healthier, wealthier, happier, and from a social researcher's perspective, they build better communities. They just do better, more stuff. They're more civically engaged, in part because they have lots of reasons to be connected to others and feel civically engaged. I've, I've taken a lot of your time, and I really appreciate your sticking with me, and I'm happy to um, answer questions now about our work, and uh, you know, both from a technical end, but I'd mostly like to hear kind of what you think uh, would be interesting for a place like mine that looks at the social impact, uh, what, what we might be profitably looking into. Yeah. Yeah, what's changing is the question just for those who are, uh, are watching. Um, the blog numbers have been absolutely steady state since 2005, and it's a much harder subject to ask about now because blogging or blog-like functions are baked into lots of other uh, t technologies. So people say, I'm doing social networking activity even when they are writing on their MySpace blog in the blog space. Uh, so that's been harder to capture. Still incredible growth in the social networking space itself. Uh, and, and it's um, older adults are now in it, which is freaking out uh, the kids. Um, but that's it, we're still seeing a lot of that. Twitter um, has, has shown some growth, although we're in the field now. And it might be the case that that's beginning to taper off in America anyway. The video numbers are higher than we're comparing them to 2007 numbers, and they're significantly higher. Uh, than 2007. And what's what's interesting is, though, even in the content creation space, there's more sort of activity in that realm. So people um, are not just posting single pictures, they're posting large albums. And they're not just posting sort of one-off videos of two seconds of them being stupid on a street corner, but they're doing lots of videos. So the intensity of it is growing, and that's a dramatic part of the story, almost as much as the sort of volume of or the, the size of the population growing. So there's there's still more to do. And there's um, I'm trying to think of what other other ways that we're going to be trying to catch as well. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens to this in the apps culture, you know, whether they uh, whether apps are enabling of this stuff or whether apps sort of pull people back into more sort of singular um, Un, not necessarily unsocial, but but sort of singular engagements with other people in media rather than sort of multiple engagements. Yeah. Um, I've uh, I've seen and in fact lived through a transition from typewriters to keyboards, and most of my interaction with a computer uh, has been sitting at something that actually has a physical keyboard. Uh, whereas when I look at my nieces with their the cell phones, and I, of course, have a Nexus one in my pocket and use it more and more often, uh, I guess it's got a keyboard, it's got a virtual keyboard, but I don't use it the same way at all. Right. And I have to imagine that that transition is affecting both uh, the content creation versus content uh, consuming um, and also the nature of the content being created, because it's easier to take a, a picture with this than it is to write two paragraphs. You know, I can write something that's 140 characters, but more than that, I don't really want, you know, I, yeah. I don't want to sit down. So I, I wondered if any of your research or any of your surveys have shown a transition as people move away from desktop systems and into the mobile computing world in what they're creating and the nature of what they read or what they look at. Yeah, the question was about the, the possible change in the nature of what people are creating as we move from a computer environment to a mobile environment. Everything that you said is is happening, um, although we don't 
we don't track it as, as so much as a change as a sort of add-on. In many cases, there are people now who are sort of living a, a life on their mobile device that is, that is supplanting time they would have spent on their computers, and they are, they are somewhat different content creators, but the, the, but the sort of big story that we capture, we don't ask you know, detailed questions about frequency, they're doing both. They, those people tend to have multiple devices in their lives, multiple times with access uh, during the day to different devices, and they think now they're beginning to think about their devices serving different purposes in ways that they didn't before. So there's, I mean, the, the standard story with lots of content creation is that there's a, you know, infatuation phase for everybody, and then there's a drop off after you've blogged a couple of times, and you, you know, three people read it, and you, they don't say anything nice about it. You stop blogging and things. Um, so that 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 continues to happen. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we see that. In, in the mobile environment, because cameras and video um, cameras are baked into the devices now, there's just a lot more picture sharing going on. It's done on the fly. Uh, we don't yet see uh, changes in, in, in activities with social networking sites yet, but it, it's one of the things we're going to keep watching because it, it It'll be interesting to see if people begin to think that they're uh, literally life logging uh, through their social networking site or something else uh, on that. And it and um, the the sort of general trend towards from, away from text towards uh, video is probably true in time allocation. But w one of the most interesting stories um, that we have captured in our teenage work is that texting is alive and well, in part because it serves different social purposes from video or other kinds of content creation. It's just nice to be private. Uh, even when you're sitting in the back seat of the car, uh, you, when you can text it, or you can do it under the dinner table, or you can do it in your classroom when your teacher isn't looking, or you can do it um, in the hallways when you don't want somebody to overhear what you're saying. There's just a sort of special power to certain kinds of, of text transactions that doesn't at all relate to the fact that they're text. It relates to the fact that they can be much more private and secure than, um, than video verbal uh, kinds of conversations. So there's something going on in that space where text is just elevated and elevated and elevated as a, as a, uh, as a, we measure it by the frequency of contact with friends outside of school. Texting has overtaken everything now by frequency of contact, not necessarily meaning of contact. Um, and we'll do, yeah, I, we're, it's, it's, it, is, it is shifting, but it's more the case that people are now doing multiple things with multiple devices and aren't necessarily giving up a lot yet in the computing environment for the mobile environment. Happier and more civically engaged. Yeah. That's a great question. The question is on causality, or, you know, are, 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 does technology make your social networks therefore make you healthy, wealthy, uh, happy, and and, uh, and civically engaged? Um, we don't have longitudinal data on this, so the answer is we don't know the directional arrow. It probably goes in both directions because we see. Uh, for sure on the technology side that the people who increasingly intensify their engagement also have, you know, grow their networks. They're just, they're bigger today than they were yesterday. Would that maybe not have happened without technology? It's possible. It might be a life stage event. It might be related to their employment. It might be related to something going on in their community that matters. But it's, it's generally the case that the more technology you have and the more that you're engaged with it, the bigger things, the bigger your network is, the more diverse it is, and the more diverse it's become um, over time. The, um, the, other w the other way that we've seen this is, and it, you know, this, this, we can't say this for sure yet because the 2008 election was so different for Americans um, than the elections that came before it, but there were, we, you, you could see that the heavy technology users were much more likely to be voters than not, and there were more 
heavy technology users and more voters than before. And obviously, there was something going on with younger voters and the Obama campaign. Uh, and so it will be interesting to see in 2012 whether that first glimmering, particularly among social networkers, the social networkers themselves, uh, people in social networking sites, were so active in promoting him, mobilizing their friends, posting new groups, forming new groups, joining new groups, um, that there it seemed to be causing a higher level engagement and then eventually higher levels of voting. But we don't have enough data to know for sure whether that's happening. And there's pretty good research in, from other places showing, um, at, at least from a social psychological standpoint, that internet use, heavy internet use, makes you more of what you already are. Extroverts became more extroverted, introverts became more introverted, and um, I, we haven't been able to duplicate that. We haven't even gone after it, but it's, it's, it's probably a pretty mixed picture. Yeah. The, the question is about generational um, uh, ferment and strife and the 60s compared to now. The, the work that we've done looking at generational differences over time, but particularly now, suggests that technology is a, a primary marker of the differences, although there is not nearly the hostility and contentiousness over technology use and the meaning of technology that there was, for instance, in arguments over civil rights and women's rights and the, and the conduct of the Vietnam War and the structure of government and, and things like that. So, so the nature of the conflicts, particularly around technology, is not nearly as intense. Sort of, you know, the consensus view uh, is that younger people know it better, use it better, uh, are more adept at it, and, you know, that okay, we can live with that. They, they might be doing silly things with it, but it's not like there are families being ripped asunder in great numbers because of technology use of that type. The parallels between the sort of larger cultural um, um, uh, issues that were unfolding in the 60s and unfolding now actually holds up pretty well. I mean, there, there, there's an economy that's going through uh, a wrench. The, in the 60s, it was the, the sort of the first stages of globalization. Now it's the it's you know much more intensified with different kinds of actors. Um, there was a question about uh, the America's place in the world in the 60s in the Cold War. There is a similar question about America's place in the world in the post Cold War world in the multipolar world and and stuff like that. And so we're the, the level of ferment about that question of what what's the right way to play it. Um, what right way for us to act in this world is is different, and technology fits into that story in part because of what uh, you know you cited um, before. People are using it in part to reinforce their views or, or find tribes like theirs uh, so that they can um, be with the with, with the like-minded. Uh, but there are other things that are playing into that story. I mean, red America and blue America is an artifact too of redistricting policies and the, and the ease with which now it's easy to figure out sort of who the Republican uh, voters in the district are and who the Democrats are, and state legislatures are really good at carving out safe Republican and safe Democratic districts, and so they're, the, the incentive for people to talk to independents and moderates in the middle is sort of less uh, evident now because our, our political structures are that way too. So there are a host of other sort of larger social changes that fit into this technology story. It's just technology is the most dramatic thing and is, and is implicated in a lot of this stuff. So it's, um, uh, that's a, um, a mushy answer to a really serious question, and I, but we don't know is, is, is a lot of what, what is where, where technology ends and where other sort of things take over. Okay, yeah. so uh, we're at the end of this, and we're really happy we're born in New York because you've gone through a lot. <laughs> we're really happy. <laughs>
mean, it's a good thing when you have to break up stuff as the questions are still coming. So, uh, huge thank you for your for your thank you. excellent presentation and your really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.